Welcome to The Art of Flow, a podcast all about optimizing learning and fostering community told through the lens of movement arts, flow arts, and fire dancing. Listen as we explore the perspectives of flow artists and fire performers on dancing, life philosophies, performance, and learning. Thanks for joining me, Morgan Dalgano, as we delve deeper into conversations with artists and community members to look at how these concepts can relate to our own lives. Hey, welcome to another episode of The Art of Flow. Today, we're talking with Kevin Axtell. Kevin has been in the flow arts and fire spinning world for 21 years currently. He's also been involved in juggling. He is the board member of the International Jugglers Association, a partner of the Flow Arts Institute, general manager of Fire Drums, and the founder and director of Club Congress. He also is the co-founder of Club Motion Juggling and Club Fest and a co-founder and director of the Firewalking Center. In addition to being an accomplished juggler and fire performer, Kevin also carries the title of Master Firewalking Instructor and is known around the world as a dynamic motivator and educator. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kevin. What a pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be a part of the first Zoom uh, version of the podcast. So I'm curious to know, since we're talking about flow arts and fire dancing today, how do you personally define the flow arts? Uh, great question. For me, flow arts is the manipulation of objects with intent above and beyond technical. Um, for example, if I'm using a spoon to eat my breakfast, uh, that is a very technical, functional, pragmatic purpose. But if I'm taking two spoons and doing some technical moves and dancing with it and, and playing with it in such a way, I would consider that a flow art. And with a physical prop, I do think that, I, it's not that I think dancing is not a flow art, because I think that dancing does involve flow, uh, but as the term has evolved and come to be in our time, I think that flow arts does involve props or manipulation of a physical object. And I think that, like I said, beyond just the technical, there's an artistic purpose or a performance purpose or a personal growth or self-gratification purpose or a sh community sharing purpose. These are all purposes I would consider above and beyond technical or pragmatic. So for me, flow arts is the uh, manipulation of objects with intent above and beyond technical. I love that you include that it is manipulation of objects and it can be any object because a lot of other previous guests have talked about floor. It can be them washing the dishes or it could be skateboarding. It doesn't have to be what we are defining as, you know, spinning rope dart or poi or things that are kind of in this weird in between between juggling circus arts and mm. flow props. Absolutely. And I also think it is a fair comparison to the word juggling and its meaning over the years. And originally juggling was to jest, to entertain, to dance, to make jokes, to entertain. Um, but over the years, um, it has become, at least in culture, a, a very specific thing, the, the tossing and catching of three or more objects. And so in some ways, juggling is all of it. But in another way, there's this cultural uh, group uh, consensus, a, an agreement of everybody a sort of as a society, what juggling is. And so too, I think is the case with flow arts. As the term evolves and emerges, society is starting to see it as, oh, the hoops and the poi and the sticks, you know? So there's what it is for us, for me, for the, in, the community that's on the inside, and there's also what is it for the external, uh, the world at large. What was it for you when you first got involved in spinning? What's your flow story? Uh, well, I had a very fun flow story. I was taught to juggle by a woman named Erin Stevens, who has gone on to become a very influential and an incredible, uh, not just juggler, but uh, community uh, organizer. And so Aaron Stevens and I actually went to the same high school in our drama class. No way, that's awesome. Yeah. She taught me to juggle three balls and I really, really enjoyed that. And it be quickly became a favorite hobby. And then uh, maybe six to seven months after that, I went to my first juggling festival. 
in Lodi, and that really, you know, set the hook. Uh, I was I was in I was I was in. But uh, I learned to juggle first, uh, and then uh, let's see. After three ball juggling, I took to one ball contact mm -hmm. juggling, and poi were my next two props, and then it just blossomed from there. And when did things shift from juggling and flow props into the fire world for you? Hmm. Well, uh, along with taking a quick enthusiasm, I want to juggle knives. I want to juggle fire. Um, there were, was a small uh, fire circle at the Lodi Juggling Festival uh, that I went to in 1999, I believe. And... Uh, that was really cool. I love that. And so instantly I wanted to, I was already juggling torches, uh, but I instantly wanted to try the poi and the staffs. And so that, that first little fire circle, now it was a juggling fire circle. And by our modern flow community standards, it was itty bitty, but it was still tons of fun. And so I started to seek out the fire jugglers and thus met the fire spinners. And how did it feel for you that first time you spun or juggled or played with fire? Because it sounds like you were already pretty drawn to some adrenaline and thrill-seeking type of stuff. Loved it. Uh, absolutely loved it. I was never like a, I, I, I liked things like skiing and I've been skydiving once or twice in my life, but I wouldn't consider myself a, a thrill junkie but at the same time it was extremely exciting it was challenging I was also starting to dip my uh, toes in the water of performance and so obviously recognizing that there was a natural draw there but I was a, I was a kid in my 20s I was like yeah fire <laughs> let's do it it did make it exciting because there is that part of juggling um, that it feels, you know, culturally as goofy or a game, uh, not re not a real pursuit. I don't believe those things, but you know, society at large can and does. And so the fire gave it an adult angle for me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like some level of mastery, some level of I wouldn't be able to do this if I wasn't considered an adult in the world's eyes. Right. Mm hmm. So I've done a little bit of light internet stalking slash research on you. And I love that you have out there a lot of conversations about the difference and the similarities between the juggling world and the flow arts world. Mm. And one thing I stumbled across was on a profile on the Flow Arts Institute that you said juggling's a unique from flow arts and its professionalism, that it's about putting on a show in high caliber of how not to just get a trick, but really nail it down to the point where you own it. And it seems like you really value this aspect of professionalism and a lot of things that you do, because I know you also do um, self-development speaking and professional motivational speaking, as well as fun creativity and community. So how does this fit into some of the new things that you've been playing around with? new relatively such as mm. fire magic mm, great question uh yeah uh segueing into that i i definitely think that the juggling world has a more developed sense of professionalism in crafting a routine it, um, it transcending tricks uh bringing character marketing business these are things that honestly the juggling world well they've been doing it longer uh and so i think i've always thought the flow arts world can and should look to the the juggling uh, world, even the professional circus world, for a model of what we can do with this. You know, we can market these things. Uh, and in terms of how that sense of refined professionalism plays in now, especially with things like fire magic, um, I am practicing quite a bit. I'm now paying to take magic courses uh, online, and in fact, are they are courses I might not have been able to go to both because of cost and time commitment. Um, but now with uh, the global pandemic, the magic school has gone online and I'm investing in it because I know how important the pizzazz is. And uh, with fire magic, things can go wrong. Uh, not necessarily in an in, uh, injury type way, although that is possible, but easily in a, oops, there goes the illusion type way. 
there's a subtlety. Um, you know, many prop skills are very direct, do the thing. Uh, but with magic, often you are concealing the thing and distracting the thing. And so learning, learning this new level of refinement um, and this self-awareness that even though I now, six years in, have a, a big list of magic tricks, fire magic tricks that I can do, I know that it's more like I know how to play notes. And I'm just randomly kind of throwing those notes together right now. I'm not yet making music with, with fire magic. And so... Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. It's interesting you touch upon this vocabulary that you're developing similar to music. You're just learning the language of fire magic and moment. And then once you have those basic building blocks, similar to maybe like the three beat weave with poi, then you can build and really dance freely with it and perform freely with the magic. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good metaphor. Absolutely. Um, and I just, I love it. It's very exciting. And I'm curious to know, you said six years ago. So what was your first encounter with fire magic? And then what made you pick it up? I love this question. Um, the, my very first memory, and in fact, the thing that set me on the path in a very early way without me knowing it, was uh, around a fire circle, 2012 fire drums, fire circle, and just hanging out. And a guy, I, I don't know his name. He must have been at least 35, 40 back in 2012. He was on the older side of the community. And he was saying, hey, have you ever tried a wonton? And I, I thought he was talking about food, but he was talking about a particular type of fire magic trick that is named for its method in preparation with flash paper that creates a wonton-esque preparation and he described it to me in the moment and at the time I didn't know what flash paper was I didn't know what flash cotton was but I could visualize what he was talking about these little sparks these little poofs that you throw at um, at random and I thought about it and talked with people about the idea but it wasn't until two years later around 2014 that I first finally just ordered some fire magic products to try this wonton um, and so that that fire circle with that with that gentleman I'm forever thankful to sort of set me on the, the path another thing which at the time I didn't consider what fire magic was was people at fire jams and fire circles sharing titanium powder with me um, that's grown into a much bigger thing recently but er earlier way back it was more like hey check this out I got a little, you try this, you're going to have sparkles in your fire. I was like, say what? Sparkles in my fire. So now I've, that's falls under mat fire magic category for me because people don't necessarily know how the sparkles are coming to be. Um, so the, I didn't consider it fire magic though. Anyway. I'm frantically searching around now for my <laughs> sklitter, I like to call it. <laughs> yeah. Well, so sklitter sure. is one particular brand of titanium powder. Uh, one of the best brands, definitely, from Ninja Pirate. Highly recommend them. It's the easiest, most reliable uh, source of titanium powder. You know, lots of us get it from uh, different places at different prices, but it's hard to get a consistent grade. And that's what you get with Splitter is reliable, consistent stuff. Um, to, to round out the story, 2014, I ordered some of the stuff and I, my very first moment, this is based on a memory from two years ago. I had my doobie ready. And I lit my first wonton, I threw it, it worked perfectly, first try, and I was like, I'm in. This is going to happen. Um, so that's, that's my uh, initial encounter and discovery with fire magic. That is so awesome. It's often not the experience that the first time you try something, especially in the arts that we do, it just goes like, oh, that's how I wanted it to go. Oh, yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And I'm curious, in your journey of learning more about fire magic and taking these classes recently, have you learned anything about the history of fire magic that you'd be able to share with us today? Yeah, um, uh, certainly. It's an extensive uh, thing to discuss, and I uh, have come to appreciate how important history is to magicians in general. Um, uh, perhaps more so, at least at first glance, than four floor artists and, and jugglers even 
uh, the magicians are way into their history. They're like, this guy is 1776. I'm like, holy crap. Um, Let me get out my timeline. Yeah, and yeah. All the color coding. Oh, yeah. And they, they also do a good job at crediting tricks. You know, that's kind of a juggling floor it's thing that's a struggle sometimes. Oh, who did that? And I invented this and you took my trick. We don't have too much trouble with that, but the magicians are all about crediting the people. So um, one of the major styles of magic that uses a lot of little fire magic is kabuki theater, Japanese theater that uses magic techniques. And they have a lot of poofies and little flash paper moments and, and little tricks. Um, the gen uh, gentlemen jugglers of the 1800s and early 1900s used a lot of flash paper with um, things like cigars and quick appearances. Um, there is an excellent, excellent magician who is still teaching, still presenting, but you know, almost retired. His name is Jeff McBride. Jeff McBride, I consider the foremost fire magician uh, in the world. Uh, he certainly um, does a lot of other magic, not just fire magic, but he's used a lot of fire magic. He has presented fire shaman ceremonies at Burning Man that use fire magic, not just in a flashy ta-da way, but in a, in a dramatic and meaningful way. Um, so Jeff McBride, big name to uh, uh, check out. Um, and then, the, uh, the modern use of it, uh, at least as it's come about through, through me and with me and my community is the use of it within fire and flow arts. We are already dancing with fire. There are ways to light your props. There are ways to color your flame. There are additives that can spark or drift or turn or poofs. There is like a podium and uh, flash powders. There's an, there is a world of hundreds of sparkers alone, things that will spark and set things off. I mean, there is electronic stuff. There is a huge world of magic uh, that has been cataloged that involves fire. Some of it is starting fire. Some of it is the flame trick itself. Some of it is in putting out fire. And a lot of it is smoke. Um, magicians have a lot of cool tricks with smoke. Um, I am currently studying at the Magic and Mystery School in Las Vegas. I'm doing it online. Uh, and so I'm learning more and more about the great history of magic, but also fire magic. And I know also, uh, I've been lucky enough to get a chance to take a class that you taught at a festival on fire magic when you showed some of these things, such as wontons, and we got to try them out. And you talked about a variety of the tools that are within your personal magic toolkit at the moment. And... Could you share with some listeners what your preferred tools are and why for you? Sure, sure. I've definitely evolved into, there's this 10% of my tricks that I, I am now keeping hidden in secret. You know, like, um, but for the most part, I'm still rather open source with my students about um, a lot of these things. First off, for anyone interested in fire magic, you got to look at the primary flash products. You have flash paper different colors, different thicknesses, different this, different that. Flash paper is a huge product and there's all kinds of it. You can get flash paper that burns off in a green flame or a red flame. Um, then you have flash cotton. Flash cotton is the type of thing that just goes poof real fast. Flash paper sizzles, flash cotton poofs as soon as there's any spark. And flash cotton can be loaded in literally over 300 devices. And so, you know, we all, you'll, everyone ends up with their favorite um, flashers that are often uh, but the flash cotton itself is the thing to get to know. And then you have flash powder, very popular these days, more so than ever before, like a podium, aka flash powder. You can put it in canes. You can put it in staffs. You know, make sure you, you get someone to teach you because flash powder can go wrong. Don't just jump into the, the serious stuff. Take the time to learn it. Um, but at the same time, uh, I feel I used to fire breathe until I was about 24, 25. And I, for me at the time, I had, I witnessed too many uh, serious injuries and it's very traumatic to be there in that moment with someone undergoing a tremendous pain, fear, panic, shock. Um, so as soon as I was in the proximity of that a third time, I was like, I'm done. But I wanted the poof and I even still respect and admire fire breathers uh, who, you know, respect the art. 
but uh, I wanted the big poof still. I wanted my big flame. So I got into to like a podium. Lyco is great for any performer, fire performer, as long as it's in the right conditions, you know, outdoor, in lots of fire conditions, et cetera. Um, and then you have flash string, which is tougher to use. Don't wrap flash string around your body. It burns. I have burned myself. My friends have burned myself with flash string near the body. Now, some people do it. It's cool. So again, if you're interested in learning, I mean, I could go off about 100 gimmicks and devices but you need to, at its core are what these devices burn or light. And those things are flash paper, flash cotton, flash powder, and flash string. Start there. So get familiar with the basics first, see what you have to work with, kind of those building blocks we were talking about before. And then you can learn from someone and add in additional apparatus or apparatus. And uh, literally what I did for many years before I actually sought out training was I would order two or three gimmicks online. Anybody with a Google engine can put search in fire magic and find a few tricks. Now, I honestly, one out of 10 I've kept over the years. So I've gone through a lot of cheap little gimmicks that didn't work for me and what I'm doing. Um, but there's a lot of gimmicks out there. You would never, if I bought three things a month, I would never run out of trying new things. Um, and I, it's far less than that. So try it, buy a couple gimmicks, take it slow, be smart. Now, I know a lot of us are kind of a DIY crowd. We like to make things. Are people making new fire gimmicks? And Maggie's like, would you recommend making any of this apparatus? Hmm. I like that question. Um, well, first off, magicians are an extremely clever crowd. I mean, we're, their devices, you know, are designed to not be obvious. Um, and they've done a good job of pre-creating. It's like, I used to make my own staffs, but I can't compete now. I can't come close to the quality that our, our community pro staff makers. And so I would suggest the same for most props. However, my friend Jesse Johnston and I, we've probably made six or seven fire magic props based on ones that I bought. Um, in some cases, the idea is genius, but the gimmick is like kind of cheap and flimsy. Like uh, I bought a fire magic book. I found it on eBay. It's a book, you open it up, there's flames, you know, like you're reading it and then you slam it shut. But the thing uh, was designed to be used like for a few seconds and put out real quick with the tiniest bit of fuel. So what do I do? Of course, I'm like, brah, fuel it up real big and I light it and let it burn and I talk and I'm throwing powders on it. And then the thing like melts away in my hand. And I'm like, hmm. So uh, Jesse and I collaborated. We made our own fire magic book. And the thing is super solid wood, dense, protected, real Kevlar. And so there are a few cases where making your own thing might actually be better. Just be smart when it comes to the, uh, I don't use the word explosives. Because um, not only is that a, an alarming word for people, but I don't feel it represents the situation. It's a, it's a minor combustion. Um, just if you're making a device that combusts something like cotton or powder, make it well because a malfunction in a fl flasher stuffed with flash cotton, that could, that, that could get you. Yeah. Be smart. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your tips and tricks and considerations. We really, really appreciate it. Sure. Also... Are you willing to talk to us about what your creative process is when it comes to coming up with performances and incorporating these different skill sets you have into performance? Sure, sure. Um, I, ha I definitely have a whole creative process uh, that's been in place for a long time in terms of juggling acts. But there is a new process that's unfolding and exploring the integration, pardon me, of fire magic with what I'm doing, you know, where now I am looking for moments to include a fire magic trick. You know, some obvious moments are lighting the torches. All right, got that. I've got several ways, reliable ways now I can light my torches creatively. Extinguishing the torches could be something with a, a, a blowout or a something, but in, in between using fire magic. And so, you know, I'm learning now that what I've been doing is just like kind of 
here's the thing. It's, whoa, it's kind of, where'd that come from? And even that's been affected, but they, there's no, no why yet. And as I'm learning in like, in good magic, like I don't just throw the wonton. The wonton has a meaning or a metaphor or a physical characteristic that it follows. Like maybe my leg shivers, it goes all the way up my body and then the wonton flies out. Now the wonton has meaning. Or if I'm giving it to the audience or lamenting or, you know, so I'm learning to like dig deeper on why I'm doing a magic trick moment. Uh, and so that's been really fulfilling in just the recent time I've been doing that. It's like, whoa, this is crazy deep. Also the, the, ma the fire magic takes this skill that I've been doing a long time. I've been doing double staff, poi, torches, fire eating, fireball, the list goes on and on. I've been doing all these props for a long time. And so we, we you know, it's important not to burn out, but everyone gets a little tired or a little stuck or a little jaded or a little bored with something after five, 10, 15, 20 years. And suddenly with fire magic, I'm like, whoa, what do I do now? Like it's a new perspective with this old prop, like double staffs, something I'm so crazy familiar with. Now it's like, what can I do with the double staff? How do I light it? How do I put it up? What kind of magic trick can I do while they're in the air? Um, it, ex it excites the mind, refreshes the enthusiasm. Like a reset. And then there's also probably, like you're pointing out, it's not just with the fire magic tools, but it's translating into your other props, into the double staffs, into the poi, into everything that you use, your juggling balls. It's now um, cross-translating. Yeah. And it's even starting to leak out of fire magic. At first I told myself just the fire magic. I'm not going to do other magic, but that didn't last long. I'm looking at, you know, making the balls appear, the clubs appear, rings and like floating and doing all this stuff. I'm like, yep, I'm in. After more exploration of magic, I'm like, yep, this is good stuff. You've been mentioning about the years that you've been involved in the flow arts and juggling and fire arts scene. I'm curious to know in this time, what are some of your favorite projects that you've worked on? Oh man, I mean, that's such a great thing to even think about. It makes me happy. I uh, love, love, love uh, fire drums. That's one of the things where, you know, I, was, I would consider myself the, maybe the first few years of my prop journey, I was, I was a juggler, as I would self-identify, I, I was a juggler. Uh, but when I found the fire dancers at that first fire drums, that changed me. Uh, and I found people who were more like me and something that I was even more into than being inside in the gym was being out in the woods, uh, throwing fire with a bunch of awesome people in a relatively sane yet wild way. Um, so definitely that. Uh, and then I grew into, uh, first I started doing fire walks for fire drums. Then I became like an organizer, then a director. And then I grew into and actually have been the general manager for five years now. Um, so that's just been a big part of my heart and my journey and my professional development, learning to be a more organized person um, because I throw lots of 20 to 50 people events, but that's a six to 700 person event and it's a whole thing. Um, and then another one I'm really, really proud of and I love so dearly is Club Congress. Club Congress has been developed and from a sort of wild clubs only party in the woods to a really well-developed workshops, special guests, super fun, high demand, low availability, you know, so usually there's 50 more people who want to go that can't type of thing. And I just love it so much. Club Congress is amazing. Um, I have been involved less so in recent years, but I love the IJA. I was a part of the IJA. I have been I've done sh shows, performances. I directed shows with them. I was a board member with them. I you know, learned a lot about performing with them. And uh, I mean, I just, there's so many events that have been so positive and impactful in my life. I could just go on and on, but I'll leave it with uh, those. What advice would you give to people who want to get involved with more projects and more of these organizations and festivals that are in existence, but aren't sure how to? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. Uh, one I think is to be persistent in your approaching and requesting to be a part of it. A good example is some often, 
not sometimes, often people will reach out to an organization that they want to help or get involved and be a part of, maybe send an email, maybe it doesn't get responded. They're like, oh, I tried. No, no, you barely tried. You barely tried. Poke them on Facebook, check in the thing. Is there an organizer application? When is the organizer application? How do I, is, I have a great idea. Is this a thing? Am I bothering you yet? Um, so one is be persistent. Uh, many of these events are run not as a full-time gig. You know, if I think of the list of Flow Festival uh, general managers and directors out there, it's not their full-time gig. They all have full-time things going on uh, as well. So you've got to be persistent. Um, I think that offering and volunteering a little bit of help is a good way not only to sort of get noticed, but to integrate yourself into the system. Many of the longtime Fire Drums family and organizers started off saying, offering an extra sh shift at the gate or something, literally. Um, and so I think that actually just, you know, because it's getting involved and getting in on the organiz on an organizational crew ahead of time is one thing. And, you know, sometimes that can be hard or there might be barriers, but on site at an event, we always need help. Every event organizer, almost ever, needs some help. And so if you're there and you offer help, now it's, uh, we're in the midst of a pandemic. So perhaps that has changed and perhaps it is more about reaching out digitally, being persistent. Um, on that note, I would say share their stuff. Seriously, as someone with, a, I can't count how many Facebook pages and profiles and accounts and things that I'm working on, when someone consistently shares my content, I definitely take notice and if they approach me, we have rapport and I am interested in working with this person almost off the bat. So if you support someone's online effort, well, everyone has got their own page. It's all like grassroots doing it yourself type thing. Man, 20 likes over the course of a month, three shares and a comment, it's gonna change your relationship with any group or organization. So that's joining up with another group and then you have spearheading your own project. Uh, that's, that's a big, big thing. I think that you should look into leadership uh, courses, webinars, trainings, videos, and, and it can range from signing up to, for a week-long course on leadership to watching the top 10 tips for leadership on YouTube. Uh, you need to research and develop and think about uh, leadership. Uh, and I think that public speaking really helps if you want to be lead projects, if you want to create and manifest things into the world of, and you, it's bigger than you can do yourself, well, then you need to talk to people. Uh, you need to inspire people, inform people. You need to draw them into you. And a big part of that is public speaking and then organizational tasks, which has been my big journey. Because when I first started organizing, oh, my God, I'm not even great now, but compared to what I used to be in terms of organization, I've come a long way. And lastly, for something like that, mentorship, get in under someone who's doing it well. Uh, for example, I, when I came in under fire drums, got to work with Noel Yee. And the guy does great project management. He does great team leadership. He's got a proven record and I learned a lot. Uh, and, and the more effective project leader because of it, no doubt. So mentorship. Thank you so much, Kevin. Those are a lot of great tips there. Just to quickly sum up, you know, be persistent, you know, seek out a mentor, seek out people who are doing what you want to be doing, who are one step or a couple steps above where you are currently and talk to them, get close to them, communicate with them mm. and um, be willing to volunteer, be willing to step up to the plate. And if something needs doing, be there to do it. Yeah. However, not everybody wants to get more involved. Some people just want to take some time and relax, kick back. And at these festivals and events that you've helped organize, run, keep going, I'm sure you've encountered some interesting scenarios. Do you have any funny stories you'd be willing to share with us that come to mind? Oh, my goodness. Uh, so many stories. Some, some are more disastrous than funny. And sometimes looking back, some things are funny, but I'm like, well, that was more of a disaster. Um, let's see. Uh, we've, we've had all kinds of uh, power, power issues, and this person hasn't, doesn't have power. This person this, uh, does. This person wants power. Um, we had a, a, a thing happen where during an event, the uh, vendor kept uh, running 
power cables uh, across a dirt path. And we had said that it needs to run around or be buried and we can get someone to help you bury it later, but right now we can't do this, it's a tripping hazard. We've got 150 people walking back and forth. We can't have these big cords across a path on the dirt at night. Anyway, he, he laid it out and the third time he laid it out and I didn't um, uh, approve this, but one of my staff cuts the dude's electrical cords just straight <laughs> off and the guy came back raging. <laughs> See, like post fun heads, I'm laughing, but it wasn't that funny at the moment. Uh, I've had lots of people uh, out of sorts, had too much, say what, call it what you will. And they have ranged from, you know, 12 people chasing a naked dude in the woods to uh, wild esoteric <laughs> journeys. Um, so that's, that's interesting. <laughs> funny stories. Uh, all kinds of serendipity over the years. Like, how did that happen? Like, someone loses their keys on a giant six-acre field, and they're freaking out, and someone just happens to walk by us without even knowing we're looking for them. And like, oh, I just found these keys, literally telling us without knowing we were looking at it. And we're like, oh. So I love little serendipitous moments like that. Ooh, one time at an event, a, uh, a tractor uh, brakes, like, went out for a second and starts rolling down this hill towards a cr group of people. And I, I think I about died. That's probably the closest I've had to a heart attack in my life. But it like stopped when he got a hold of it. And ever since then, I've been really uh, anxious about large machinery and hills. <laughs> yeah, fire farming, not a good idea, guys. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> yeah. um, a few small camps catching on fire, breaking the rules, having little campfires, not tending to it. Oh. I won't name any names whatsoever or even the event, but there was one event where it was 3 a.m. and uh, a woman comes running into the organizer camp and says, we need help right away. So it's like, boom, all hands on deck. What's going on? And she said, there's a woman screaming in the water. We run over to the water and we can hear it. It's like blood curdling and we're like someone being assaulted. What's happening? It's very dark. So we have headlamps. The creek is about that deep. We're you know, a bunch of organizers trying to figure out what happened. Um, she had fallen in blackberry bushes and was just a little out of sorts and unable to get out of the blackberry bushes. And so we assisted her out of the blackberry bushes compared to what we thought was happening. Um, bloody oh. merch. It was just falling in some light blackberry bushes late, late at night in a creek. Uh, again, post hence, kind of funny, but in the moment, not so much. Kind of going off of that, I feel like a lot of us have moments where something happens to our props or the tools that we manipulate or play with, like they break or you get lost over the side of the mountain or random things that you never considered when you first bought or made this prop. What's happened on a personal front for you? Well, along with breaking many things, especially as both an avid club juggler and an avid contact juggler, like one ball contact. Uh, I've broken many glasses, screens, holes in walls, uh, ceiling fans. Uh, but some of the more memorable ones, uh, I was at an event called Strawberry Music Festival with my brand new four inch, super shiny acrylic. Just having the time of my life. I drop it, it hits my foot, rolls into a large lake, right as I dove and almost grabbed it and I spent an hour, two hours wading through neck deep water, trying to find this thing with my toe, never found it. Uh, and I've sent, um, oh, recently with a trip uh, to Yosemite with Aaron Stevens, I got this one on video, the ball like, we climbed close to the big waterfall and we're juggling on a rock and I dropped the ball and it went down and like it was in this spot where it maybe could have reached it, but definitely one mistake and I would have fallen in the water and not just water, raging post waterfall water. And so I, would, I was just, you know, younger me, 20 year old me would have been crawling all over that in a second, but uh, I'm almost 40. And so 40 year old me was like, uh, it's, it's gone. <laughs> Goodbye ball, Bye. have fun over the waterfall. It's a better end than many juggling balls meet, so, you know. Yeah, I, I feel you on that. A lot of times water and cliffs seem to be the way that they go. But there's sometimes those random rescues, like I, I lost a poi into a stream and was able to follow the stream down river and actually 
retrieve it, which was amazing. Nice. Um, I ask about all of these kind of funny disasters. The moment it's like, oh, what is happening? But then later on, you can laugh about them. Because I feel like a lot of us can sometimes forget that with all the accomplishments and all that we achieve and the tricks that we're able to do now and that you're working towards, that nobody is perfect. Mm. Hallelujah. I have one more too that I just remembered. I tried to make my own fire boogang out of wire and cardboard. And before you go, what? I, I thought that I could make the wire skeleton, the cardboard shell, and then totally wrap the cardboard in aluminum foil tape. And in my mind, it was going to be fine. So first burn, of course, I'm doing it. And like one wick falls to the ground and I look over and it's like on the ground, I'm like, uh-oh. And then as I turn my head to look at this thing, it's like melting, <laughs> this prop. And I just, oh, that was funny. Oh my gosh, yes. Uh, I, um, the San Francisco Conclave this year, we're trying to do some... Um, not boot gang. They were trying to do the prop that is like a hoop, but it has lots of things streaming from the ends. I, this I'm blinking on the name right now. Uh, was, of, oh, like is it the, lots of things streaming from the ends? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's a, a toy from India, actually. Oh, oh, oh! Yes, yes. Uh, the shikar wheel. Yes, they tried to make miniature versions of those, a couple of them, and they did something similar with the insulation wrap that didn't quite work out mm -hmm. for the first round, but then they tried again. You live and you learn. So how do you connect and create community aside from the various roles that you hold? Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, like you said, aside from uh, managing several uh, events that include community in different ways, uh, I like to host little fire gems when and where I can. Even though I live up in the mountains, we have a small little fire community and we like to get together uh, and do our thing. I also like to try to go to at least one new event a year. Obviously this year might be a little hiccup in that plan, but it's taken me all over to some of the different events. You know, Equilibrium in Kansas, the Florida Flow Fest. Um, it goes on and on. So part of it, it for me is just there's a lot of cool flow events to be a part of, and it's easy for me to be in my you know, circle, like Pack Fire, Fire Drums, the California Juggling Festivals. I could easily just hang there, do my thing, and or only go to places where I'm invited to perform uh, and or teach a workshop. But it does mean something to me to try and get out to an event as a participant um, and, you know, not only like feedback loop into the community, but to meet different people and, and be a part of different things so it goes both ways it's like bring people in to you and go out to other people I love that every year you have this goal to go to new events and meet new people expand your circles what are three of the people who have been most influential to you mm. and when I saw this question I'm like oh only three so I have I have more than three um, well first off my wife Brandy excels the most influential person in my life and we've grown and changed and been through a lot together. So she's the most impactful person in my life. And then I have my mentor, Tali Burkan, who is a firewalking uh, legend, basically. And I'm very fortunate to not only get, live near him, but to have trained extensively with him and to still be friends with him. Extremely wise, uh, powerful individual, not physically powerful, but mentally, spiritually powerful. Um, so Tali and Brandy, you know, right off the top. And then talking more about prop manipulation and event organization and all of that, just a few names, Erin um, Stevens. Not only did she teach me how to juggle, literally starting me on the path, but what she does in the world. If you're not familiar with her name and you're listening to this podcast, look up Erin Stevens, IJA. Um, I can't say enough about how brave, how bold, how compassionate this woman is. Uh, so Aaron Stevens is a big one. Uh, the Johnston brothers, Jeremiah and Jesse, are, have had the biggest influence on my juggling style. They have been my juggling friends, my juggling homies, flomies, uh, juggle, juggle buds for life, for real. And so we, when you juggle a lot with someone, they really influence your style. And then in terms of event organization, 
um, and things like that, I would have to say Noel Yi, who's had a big influence on uh, my capacity to organize and create things. Uh, so I skirted around the three people there. Sorry, but that was my answer. That's okay. You did three by category. <laughs> also, I love that you mentioned your mentor who you learned firewalking from. And I'm curious to know, in what ways has firewalking and the floor arts impacted your mind, body, and spirit? You started to go into that a little bit. Quite a bit. Um, it, it has been a big part of uh, staying with it, so to speak, I think. Uh, I think many people struggle around the three-year mark, the five to seven-year mark, the 10-year mark. Um, and so to be consistently, unendingly, interested and passionate about juggling and flow and fire arts for over 20 years now. Um, I do credit a fair amount of that to the personal growth world, the firewalking world, like it's something I want, it's important to me, I keep that fire alive when I, there's something that challenges me, because you know I screw up all the time, absolutely, but I keep going. I get knocked down like a mofo, but I get back up and try again. And so that mindset has kept me living and loving these art forms. Also, as a professional performer, um, I made my living solely as a juggling and fire performer for 10 years. Now I include firewalking and motivation, event management. I have expanded. But for 10 years, I was just a juggler and just a fire dancer. That was hard. Anyone who's doing it, has done it, or plans to do it, knows that it is a challenge and it took more than you know i was never great at marketing i was never great at character i was pretty good at all these things decent and a pretty darn good juggler um but i was motivated and kept going and when i wanted to quit i used the personal growth uh psychology to to help me through it that said i'm also extremely blessed um, with good health good circumstances and so, you know, it's, I, I try not to be like, I did it all myself. I, I had a pretty lucky preset of circumstances, physically able, you know, serious mental illness, uh, support community. Uh, so I've been, you know, I had a pretty good starting point. Um, and I, that's always worth mentioning. What inspires and keeps you as inspired to spin? Because you talk about that three-year mark, the five-year mark, 10-year mark, whatever intervals where it would be easy to sort of waver in commitment and enthusiasm towards something. And you also mentioned that you use a lot of personal development tricks and these um, mind reprogramming tricks to continue to stay connected. Yeah, great question. Um, one of the things I learned early from another school of thought was not to idolize or idealize the, the community. I think that many people when they're young and they find the flow arts world, the fire dancing world, there's a sense of finally, I found my, you know, my people. Finally, I, you know, these people are awake and conscious and you know, tuned into the grid and, and all that and et cetera, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and then what happens is somebody, uh, wrongs them in a way, which is always really sad and unfortunate. And um, I'm not celebrating wrongness happening to, to a person, but when that happens, I think people who have idealized the situation then say, oh, I'm done, I'm out. This is not what I thought. You know, two, two sour lemons in a batch of 100 amazing yummy lemons, you know, you, you, you taste the sour lemon and you're like, I'm done with lemons. And there, so I've sort of had this, it was more from a, uh, like a spiritual centric teaching that this idea that we are who we are and as we are, and we're super flawed and the fire arts world is kind of edgy. The flow arts world, oftentimes we have people who are hurt and who hurt others. And that is not a symptom of an ill fire arts community. It is a symptom of humanity. It's a part of humanity. So when people have wronged me or when I have screwed up or when something in the community has gone awry and made me upset or angry, I feel like I fairly quickly 
restructured my mind to go, I still love juggling. Mm, I still love fire. I, at the core of what this is about, you know, not only the tricks and the exercise and the personal physical transcendence, but the community of being around fire with people, flowing with friends, juggling with friends. At its core, it's beautiful and wonderful. And um, the ability to refocus on that and refocus on that and refocus on that. Uh, keeping it fresh. I, without trying to boast, I do a lot of props. It's crazy. It's insane. I need a whole prop room just to gather the props that I do. And I just go on and on. I'm fairly good with a lot of them. Uh, juggling world alone, balls, clubs, rings, diabolos, balance tricks. Uh, then we have the whole fire world of, of torches and double staffs and fire eating and fans and whips and swords. Uh, not to mention the fire magic realm and all the little gimmicks and tricks. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. And I've taken on about one or two new things every year. I think if you really get, it's, it's good to specialize as a performer because then you get very good at what you're doing. But as a hobbyist, right? Because some people start as a hobbyist, they become a performer, but then they lose the hobbyist part and they're just performing, they're just doing the motions to get paid. But if you can refresh your interest, your zeal, your passion, your curiosity, that biochemical reward when you do something new for the first time, right? I, I recently got Slinkies from Slinky Josh. Do I plan on performing Slinkies? Probably not, but it's fun. It's new. I get it. I'm like, woo, I'm loving it. I got Slinkies. Uh, pen spinning. Uh, it, there's... It's not just about learning a new trick so you can perform it someday. You keep things fresh for yourself. Novelty is powerful. And if it's an exploration and if it's a journey and if things are unfolding before you, it's more enjoyable. And if you do the same thing over and over and over and over again, it gets boring. I can hear from the way you talk about the new things that you acquire, the skills that you seek out, that you're a curious person and curiosity is a value that's very important to you. I'm curious to know if also in, in this switch you're talking about, you know, if you're a performer, specialization makes sense. If you're a hobbyist, then exploration makes sense. And in the time you've been both and you still are both. So where does meditation and mindfulness fall into this whole mix? Oh, uh, another great question. I think that there is a couple places. One is in the actual trick itself. You know, if you imagine trying a very difficult trick that you fail at many times, meditation and mindfulness is a nice mental reset. It's a calm thing. It gives you a perspective grounded. Once you just sit down and breathe and do your best to clear your thoughts, you don't need to be on a mountain in the Himalayas to meditate. Um, and you get that clear mind, you're going to be more able to pull off that trick. Uh, and it's also in the mindset of continuing. If you get frustrated with a business, with a community, with a, a friend, um, meditation can help give you better perspective on it. I've always considered juggling as a move, moving meditation because when I'm, if I'm doing something super easy, maybe not, but if I'm actively engaged in the skill of juggling or spinning, I have to be present moment to be there, right? If I'm trying tough tricks with three clubs, I can't, I'm not thinking about what's going on tomorrow. I'm not thinking about what are they gonna think? How am I gonna do this? I'm right there in the moment. And so I love object manipulation because for me it is a meditation. Thank you so much for speaking a little bit on that and elaborating. I'm also curious to know you, probably know way more about the history of our West Coast floor arts community than I could possibly even ask you questions about. And so if you were to have recorded for history, something to be remembered 20 years, 40 years, 50, 100 years from now, about how it's burgeoned here on the West Coast, what are like three things you'd share to be remembered? Well I'll talk specifically about flow arts because juggling has this whole really long history. But juggling in the flow and fire arts, uh, as they are, 
certainly while there are things very similar that go back in history as they are, I really feel one of the key points to mention first is Burning Man. Burning Man and the Great Fire Circle and the zealous practice and participation in fire arts uh, in a very liberal and welcoming environment absolutely helped to crescendo the flow arts, fire dancing and prop spinning uh, into a more mainstream interest. It, you you got to mention hoops, of course, because right hoops are now considered part of flow arts, but hoops have been a very popular prop for over 50 years in, in the United States. And when while there's this old style of hoop and this more new style of hoop, you know, you got to include hula hooping because um, it is very much arguably the most manipulated prop on this planet in terms of juggling or flow arts. So you have hooping and Burning Man and festival culture. Seriously, as a young festy kid myself, we, are, we were there on the side of the stage or in the back of the crowd or in the doing thing. You had your friends who were spinning boy, you had your hula hooper buddies, your flaggers, the jugglers. We all hung out together at every festival. And they were like mini flow festivals because we were going to festivals and flowing music festivals, world music festivals, all kinds of music festivals, not just the, uh, the hippie genre either. Uh, major, major events uh, had a lot of poi. Um, gloving has some history in the flow arts, the dance inclusion. And I think that from the Burning Man scene came this scene uh, in definitely LA, but as more I'm familiar with, the Bay Area, San Francisco and Oakland, and the Vulcans, and uh, the spinning, the spinning creation, the spinning innovation that took place in the Bay Area it made it an epicenter, global epicenter for flow arts knowledge. They were getting together, spinning a lot, not just at festivals anymore, together intentionally for spinning jams and talking and geeking out on the tech and the nerdiness and the internet was just coming about to be a broad thing and they started blasting it everywhere. Um, and that's not an exclusive list because many things have contributed to it, but off the top of my head, that, those are some of the most important notes in that. I guess finally, the creation of uh, flow and fire festivals. It's not, a, it's not like Burning Man, which is all, all the art. It's not a music festival. It's a flow festival and fire festival, starting with fire drums and then wildfire and pack fire and on and on and on. The flow and fire festival became a clear community. And from there, they, they blossomed. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Burning Man's fire spinning culture and embracing of the art was one thing you mentioned. Gloving culture and, you know, the innovations and tech that came out of it and just its own unique also community. And we also touched upon just the Vulcan tech crew, <laughs> the insane amount of shapes that they have created. I think behind me, you got some stuff going on. Thanks Vulcan. Uh, and also, you know, it's special to have flow and fire festivals because it's, a little bit more of a narrowed community gathering, a space where a niche interest can come together, not just for a jam, but for a whole weekend or a set period of time that's longer than a couple hours to exchange knowledge and hang out and collaborate and connect. Yeah, and I just love it, you know, because at this point in my life, I don't want to travel miles looking for the next fire jam. I want to go to the fire jam. And that's where I want to be. And I want to learn tricks with my friends all day and then play with fire at night. And so I love it when that's exactly what's going on. Pausing on looking back at history for a moment, what's happening now? I see the whole time we've been talking, there's this Club Fest logo over your head. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, well, as we've discussed, I'm an event producer and event manager. And so when all my events were clear cut as everyone else's, um, Man, I needed something to do. Uh, so uh, we're doing a digital club fest. Club fest is built on the idea of club congress, meaning it's club specific. We're not like point spinners can't come. No, come on over. But we're going to talk about clubs and watch clubs and have shows about clubs and workshops. But it's all going to be clubs. Can we really do clubs for 48 hours? Oh, yeah. 
definitely. We do clubs for four days in a row at Club Congress. So uh, Club Fest is no problem. We got amazing guests, world-class performers, workshops. It's taking place May 23rd and 24th. You can Facebook Club Fest or look up the hashtag Club Fest and uh, help you find it. Uh, hopefully, Morgan, with this, you can include a link to the event page. Yep, please look at the show notes and description below for that. And we're excited to pursue a multi-platform thing. Uh, one of my teachers talked about how, you know, that we're in a time when one of the most valuable things you can get from this type of endeavor is the skills. For example, I don't anticipate to make a windfall, if anything, on Clubfest financially, but I've already learned a lot. I have developed professionally in this zealous effort to multi-platform. You know, we're gonna, at different times, we're gonna be on Zoom, TikTok, YouTube, Twitch, Instagram, Facebook. We're just, uh, we're just gonna try it, not, you know, not all at once all the time, but we're gonna try to strategically use all of it. And in the post-pandemic world, these are valuable skills. Um, but professional development aside, if you are interested in club juggling, if you like club juggling, if you want to get better at it, uh, regardless if you're a very beginner, we got total beginner workshops and classes, or if you're a super pro experience, we got the, the new fresh, fresh, the shtis, as they say. Um, club Fest is going to be amazing. I'm so excited. It gives me a reason to uh, get up excited, and I need that in my life. I'm so excited. I'm so glad that you're organizing and offering this in the virtual space because right now, well, things are different and especially depending on, you know, your social economic, your job situation, so many variables, things may be dramatically different that we can still learn and we can still mm. all come together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Pausing on the present and looking at the future, what would you say your ideal world is? Oh, wow. Big question. Yeah. Um, I think that I want to see a world where we are talking and listening to each other more and insulting each other less when we have matters, uh, differences of opinion. I see a lot of people calling other human beings, other fellow country you know, people from their same country, their same region, maybe their kids go to the same school and they're saying, you're stupid, you're dumb, you're an idiot, you're, a, you're this, you're that, you're a conservative asshole, you're a libtard. No, they're both human beings and uh, we, you know, if we can approach each other with more patience, compassion and understanding and tolerance for different perspectives, it's killing me. It all seemed to go downhill so fast. I know it's been a long, slow change, but you know, my liberal friends are, are treating my conservative friends terribly, and my conservative friends are treating my liberal friends terribly. And there is common ground. Um, and I that's what I want. Uh, more more discourse, more discussion, more patience, more compassion. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. I really, really relate to what you expressed, you know, being able to have a conversation is just the starting point, but the divisiveness and the tendency that our human society and our culture here in the States has towards uh, one side versus another, us versus them, Republican versus Democrat, it's just, there's not room for it being on a spectrum it's like you have to choose a category and personally i'm a relativist and so i dramatically reject that <laughs> yeah it's, it's interesting to see um, so if you could step into my shoes and ask yourself a question what question would you ask yourself Oh, well, you did cover firewalking because that's a big part of my journey, uh, but specifically firewalking at events. Um, over 10 years ago, uh, my wife and I brought the first firewalk to Firebirds, uh, and it continued since then. But not just that, um, as a firewalk instructing trainer, I have trained many fire dancers to now be firewalks. And so over the course of the past 10 years, 
firewalking has become a part of the Flow and Fire Festival experience. And so probably would have mentioned something along those lines because um, I was certainly largely uh, a part of catalyzing that. And also fire contact juggling, which is something that I just dearly love. It bridges, it's a little fire magic, it's a little contact juggling, it's a like, little bit like fire walking because it's that hot fire right in your hand. One of my favorite things is fire contact juggling, so I might have mentioned that. Would you mind letting us know a little bit more about your personal journey into fire walking? Sure, yeah, fire dancing actually took me to fire walking. I was, you know, first a juggler and then I learned the fire arts and loved those. And then I went to fire drums and I was like, oh, this is the best. Um, and then I got hired to do a fire show at a fire walking instructor training graduation. So as part of their celebration for completing their course, I came in and I did a fire show. And it was crazy and fun and the group energy was really high. And afterward, they let me fire walk. And it was, it was awesome. And uh, I didn't know at the time that it was a long firewalk. Most firewalks are six to eight feet, maybe 10. This one was like 20 feet because it was their grad night firewalk. And my wife and I walked across it and I was like, whoa. So anyway, they hired us again the next year. And after doing it two years, uh, we decided we wanted to take the course because it's crazy. These people are crazy. What's going on here? And so we, we took the course ourselves. And ever since taking the course ourselves, uh, after that, we assisted Tali. We were his assistants until he retired. And then I took the reins. And why did you bring firewalking into the fire festivals? Like, what's the magic in firewalking that you connect with that you wanted to share? Well, a big part of it was it gave me the, for lack of a better word, the courage to continue on as a professional performer. I mentioned before. For 10 years, all I did was juggling and fire dancing. And that had, came with a lot of struggles, a lot of doubts. But I often called on the teachings of fire walking to take the risk, keep pushing forward. If what, I worth, if what I want is worth it, then it's worth some suffering, some challenge, some risk. And I just kept moving forward. So that was a big part of why I wanted to share it with the community. Also, I was like natural fit, fire walking, fire dancing, they're fire people. So there was that side of it. Um, and then there's a certain quality to raising your energy in fire walking. We, you know, people do it all kinds of different ways and there's almost no wrong way to do it. Uh, but you raise your energy before you do a fire walk. And that taught me to raise my energy before I fire perform. And that made a difference. And I think it's fair to say I'm known as an exciting, dynamic, energetic fire performer. And that's because I don't just okay, I'll light my props and kind of wander out. Like, I, you know, in that moment, right before you fire walk, you're like, whoa, very prime, very high energy, very like, boom. And so it helped me to get in that state before I do any fire arts. And um, so those are the reasons why I thought it'd be a good fit for floor arts. So creating that hype, creating that change and shift of energy and mindset it's something that you don't just do in firewalk and creating that experience for others it's something you do before any performance now that you experienced it in another area yeah and one more addition to that um fire has the energy of empowerment and motivation for me because i do firewalking and uh i associate fire with empowerment and by simple and instant association, when I use fire in prop manipulation, that transfers over because fire to me is empowerment. Fire is personal growth. Fire is spiritual power. And so when I fire dance, I have to bring some of that energy with me. What does magic now represent to you? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, magic started as a way just to try to keep myself not just interested, but interesting to people because I mean, to be honest, I'm getting a little older. Like I said, I'm almost 40. The kids these days are so good. It's insane. They're way better than I ever was in terms of skill. So it's like, well, how am I going to stay noticeable or whatever? Um, and so it's playful, like, oh, I got to keep things fresh. Um, but it's turned into more than that. And, you know, I like, I like the element of mystery. Like when I let off a perfectly timed, what just happened? You, you know, whoa. and it's like punctuating my, if, if, if you look at a fire routine as 
a song or a melody, you know, these are dynamic punctuations. And it also catches the eye. When you watch something, you start to, you know, lose focus. You start to gaze away and look at other things. This is for anything, if it's similar. And so when you're watching, if I'm doing a, a, a routine with fire magic, right, as that starts to happen, pow, what was that? What's next? It draws the eye back in. And finally, I'm uh, really inspired now to not just use it as the occasional punctuation, but as the whole thing, uh, a full story around fire magic. We've mentioned stories a couple of times throughout our conversation. I think it's because a performance is a story. If you draw somebody in and shares a message, what are the stories you love to see and the one do you love to create? Um, I, yeah, I, I, love, uh, I love energy, I love overcoming. I, love, I like when there's a mistake and you overcome that mistake and you keep, you keep going. I, I'm, I, I've always been kind of an energy guy. Uh, you know, I don't get too specific on what is energy and all that. I just, I know it's there. And so things that make you feel something, I like wow moments, I like what moments, I like the WTF moments, I like the oh moments, like moments, you know, more than just cool. But like, I like to give moments and, uh, and I think you, that question that you just asked is kind of where I'm headed. I'm, I'm working on defining that as we speak. Yeah, stories are something that are always being written and rewritten and they may come to a close, but there's always like a sequel or a prequel or yeah. unfortunately, I, I, our I, moment. Sorry, I thought of one last thing. I was thinking of a story uh, in character development and that is a young pyromancer who is learning the art through these books and having things like funny mistakes. This goes off or that catches on fire or my hat catches on fire accidentally. Like play a character of a young pyromancer trying to learn the ways and use humor. I love that. I really, really enjoy when the unexpected happens in a piece, but in a very planned and kind of expected way, especially when it's like a student learning. Mm. There's a lot to relate to. Unfortunately, our moments are kind of coming to an end here. And this story, as far as the Art of Flow episode, is coming to close. But remember, you can still connect with Kevin in so many ways. Find him on social media. The links are below in the description and the show notes. Also, um, Club Fest, go. I'm not going to say more. Just go. Yeah, absolutely. Go. May 23rd, May 24th. All club juggling, all levels. 20, no, pardon me, 48 hours of fun live broadcast with clubs. And you want to go check it out. It's free. Come have fun with us. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us. And thank you so much, Morgan. I really appreciate uh, this podcast and that you've been consistently putting out multiple episodes and following through and developing and getting better at it. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you for listening to The Art of Flow. You can find more episodes on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, or by visiting theartofflowpodcast.com. We love to hear from you, so feel free to send questions and podcast suggestions to theartofflowpodcast at gmail.com.